I started gathering performance data on my JEB Code Zero and cruising shoot to make a crossover chart to inform my choice of which cell to use on my G434. Although the numbers are only valid for my boat and sails, I realised that the relative performances would be much the same for any modern Finkel yacht, and therefore of interest to many owners. The G4 was designed for 140% overlapping Genoa, which I used for a couple of seasons. However, I found more often than not, by the time I reached the sea on a nice summer's day, a fair old sea breeze had set in, meaning I was beating out into over 20 knots apparent, which was just too much for the Genoa. Reef down it didn't go well to windward, and changing to my 105% short-handed was just too difficult. I gave up, apart from the odd race, and left the Genoa in its bag. With the jib I could keep full sail up to 22 knots, and then take in slabs in the main. By 30 knots I'm still using a full jib with three slabs. Only after that do I need to roll the jib, and a few rolls in that affect its shape much less than the Genoa so the need to change down to a storm jib is much reduced. The other bonus is that it is now much easier to short tack back up the river. Performance when it is windy is still fine, even off the wind. Performance to windward is okay, and above about 8 knots I hadn't really suffered much. I just had to power up the main rather than flatten it as I had to do when the Genoa was in place. The downside is when I crack off more than 20 degrees in light to moderate winds. I began to notice I was losing out to boats who could easily outpace in more wind. The solution came to me when we passed this Arcona crew playing with their new Code Zero. After seeing the Arcona, I began to notice a lot more Code Zeros about, and they seemed to work quite well. At least they did once the wind came round on the beam. Researching Code Zeros, I first had to get my head around the terminology. Every sailmaker seems to have a different name for them. A cruising code zero are a different beast from a racing one and should not be confused. They typically have a fairly short leech and a high clue to optimise tight reaching. Quantum calls their offering an A0 and their written description comes the closest to my impression of a code zero of any of the main manufacturers. Though the pictogram shows it being useful in stronger winds than either I or their own description would recommend. One sales call their offering an FFR, a free flying reacher, and their pictogram for its functionality is probably the most realistic of the lot. The North G0 is what I eventually bought, but I find it slightly closer winded right across the wind range than North Show. And although it might not be the most effective sail, it will work in the area shown as G1 territory. Before ordering, you need to make sure your boat can support a Code Zero. You need clearance at the foot and at the head for the furlers and for the roll sail. The attachment points also have to be able to take the high loads involved. In my case, I already had a product, but seldom would not certify it for use with a Code Zero. I fitted another pad eye to reduce the projection, which also meant I could use it with the anchor in place. I then withdrew the bottom bolt from the forestay tang, reversed it, and fitted a ring instead of an ordinary nut. From that I spliced a dyneema strop to the front of the prodder to act as a bobstay. For good measure, I also added a dyneema strop to the bottom of the bow roller, to show that it could sear the load with the prodder. The other advantage I gained from this arrangement was that I got a two-to-one purchase without having to use a full-length double-purchase halyard. The V-shaped attachment of the tack line also prevented the tack line rotating instead of the torsion rope. I gained space at the top end, after consulting with Sparcraft, by rerouting one of the halyards from the spectacle fair leads just above the forestay attachment to a new fair lead just below the masthead sheave. Finding a calm enough day to test the sail's close reaching capabilities was an ongoing problem. For a first trial I ran off down the stour in 12 knots of wind at 120 degrees true. The sail was easy to set and seemed to be pulling well, bringing the apparent wind forward 30 degrees to 90 degrees apparent at 10 knots, and giving about 6 to 7 knots of boat speed 
I was very pleased with that. That was until I looked at old videos which showed the boat doing almost as fast a speed under the jib in similar wind conditions. I decided to try measuring the boat speed under jib and then hoisting the code zero and seeing what difference it made whilst on the same course and in the same wind. We started off under jib with 13.5 knots apparent wind at 100 degrees and 6.7 knots of boat speed. By the time code zero was hoisted and pulling, the boat speed had increased to 7.4 knots, but the apparent wind had increased to 15.3 knots at 120 degrees. That was quite a significant increase in wind speed, but at a much lower angle, making it impossible to assess the difference the code zero had made to boat speed. I tried to reduce the time between observations of the jib and the code zero by pre-hosting the code zero so that all I had to do was to unfurl it. The interesting thing about this clip is that I appear to have lost about 0.3 to 0.5 of a knot in boat speed because of the interference of the code zero with the wind flow over the jib. When I could bear away into suitable conditions to try this out, I appeared to gain 0.5 to 0.6 of a knot. But even in the relatively short period of time it took to do this, the wind speed and direction had changed again. It was obvious that the only way I was going to be able to compare the sail's performance was to make observations of boat speed at a wide range of true wind speed and angles with both sails. Whilst it took a long time to gather enough observations for a full comparison, the upper wind speed limits of the Code Zero quickly became apparent. I decided that it was not worth hoisting the sail in over 10 knots at 80 degrees true, 12 knots at 90 degrees true, or 15 knots at 120 degrees true. The sail could be carried in slightly more wind, but the boat didn't go any faster unless I dumped the mainsail to bring her upright. In any case, it wasn't worth pushing that hard, because when there was enough wind to generate 14 to 15 knots over the jib, that gave just as much boat speed as the Code Zero. Finally, I found a light wind day to do some testing, and in six or seven knots true, you could sail just about as close to the apparent wind with the code zero as you could with the jib. 30 degrees was probably pushing it a bit, 40 degrees was more realistic. This wasn't a fair comparison though, because the jib could sail much closer to the true wind, whilst the code zero only got up to about 60 degrees true. However, if that took you where you wanted to go, you could get an extra knot of boat speed, compared to the jib. Mind you, if you freed off another 10 degrees under the jib, that went a long way to closing the difference. Even in these light winds, whilst the true wind was on or forward of the beam, the code zero was still outperforming the jib by about 0.8 of a knot. However, as the true wind of six knots came above the beam and the apparent wind fell, Boat speed dropped off so much that it was impossible to quantify any difference in performance of the headsails, even though the Code Zero continued to pull as far back as 120 degrees apparent. The magic figures to achieve performance seem to be to keep at least 7 knots of wind forward of 120 degrees. That ensured a boat speed of 5 knots or more. If the wind dropped below that, it only took a slight gust to get you back up to 5 knots. The easy way to achieve that would have just been to harden up, but that wasn't always possible. 10 knots of true wind 
was the sweet spot for close reaching with a Co Zero. It was only viable from 80 degrees, but between 80 degrees and 110 degrees true, it gave a lot more boat speed than the jib. Lower than that, and the benefits faded to half a knot by 130 degrees, and disappeared altogether by 140. Entering the harbour with 11 knots of wind at 140 degrees, the Code Zero seemed to be pulling well. But the jib gave pretty much the same figures, and most of the drive must have been coming from the mainsail. Although the Code Zero gave up completely below 150 degrees, for shortish distances in flat water it paid to goose swing the headsail. The boat was very sensitive to small changes in wind speed and direction in the range between 10 to 14 knots whilst on a beam reach. In 10 knots at 80 degrees true she was fine, but in 12 knots at 80 degrees true, shown here as 16 knots at 50 degrees apparent, she was overpressed and going slower than she had in 10 knots, unless the main was eased. However, in 14 knots at 90 degrees true, she was just about okay. And in 12 knots at 100 degrees true, she felt pedestrian. Whilst the Code Zero was powered up and the boat was not overpressed, the Code Zero gave at least a knot more boat speed than the jib. Using the Code Zero in 12 knots at 120 degrees true, was a very comfortable way to sail. It was not quite as fast as using a cruising chute, but the wind only needed to move forwards by 10 degrees and you were getting the same speed, but still had the capability to handle it if the wind headed more or increased in strength, either of which would have forced you to bear away or drop a cruising chute. With the true wind at 120 degrees, the Code Zero could be carried in 16 to 20 knots, and at 130 to 140 degrees, up to 20 knots. However, I wouldn't consider hoisting the sail in that much wind, as the advantage over the jib was only a couple of tenths of a knot. If the sail was already up, you could take advantage of the performance though. The next few clips demonstrate the sort of situation where the Code Zero can make a good choice of sail. We were reaching to the Orwell under jib, making 4.9 knots in 10 knots of apparent wind at 60 degrees. After hoisting the Code Zero, boat speed immediately rose to 5.8 knots, and then to 6.6 .6 knots as the wind increased to 13. I had to harden up a bit to clear the spit off the pilot station. The wind coming forward increased the apparent wind speed to 14 knots, giving a boat speed of 7 knots. This was too close and too strong for the cruising chute. Then, in a slight gust, the wind speed rose even further to 16 knots, which was overpressing the boat and the auto helm was struggling to cope. I had to stop filming and dump a bit of the main at which point boat speed increased to 7.4 knots.
Once past the spit, we were on a broad reach, and the cruising chute would have been a better sail, giving perhaps half a knot more boat speed. But I knew that once past the moored ships, I'd have to harden up again, and that might well be too close for the cruising chute. That proved to be the case, and, as earlier, though we might well have carried the chute for most of the reach to Levington, the gusts would have forced us to drop it. Rounding Conover Point at Levington, the wind came further and further aft, until we were on a dead run. At sea, the cruising chute would have been a bit of sail, but only if it were pulled out. For a short distance in flat water like this, when you're in pure wind jabbing mode, goose-winging the sail, simply by leaving it where it is and jibing the main, presents just as much sail area to the breeze. This is at its most efficient, running very slightly by the lee to get reverse flow over the main, and the wind spilling off the main helps to keep the sail full. Doing this, we overtook a 40-footer, attempting the same trick with his Genoa. The code zero gave us half knot more boat speed, and we soon left him well behind. Although the wind was light, we had 4.6 knots of boat speed, plus a knot of tide. There's certainly no need for the engine. I'm not a believer in sailing the angles in a non-planing boat. However, this 60-foot doghouse spirit was giving it a try. At first it didn't look promising, but once she got to the other side of the river and jived back, she was off like a rocket. Maybe she just got a lucky puff, or maybe sailing the angles always works in a boat that fast. I bought a general purpose cruising chute when I bought the boat. I'm not quite sure what its performance characteristics are supposed to be, but they seem close to the north pictograph of a G2 runner, as it will not pull effectively closer than 110 degrees true and seems very full. It's also cut very short in the luff. That means that you get good visibility underneath it, but from the helm you cannot see or tell where it is setting. On a long run from Whitby to Harwich, it gave us 7 to 7.5 knots in 12 knots of wind, 120 degrees true. That was until we got it into a mighty tangle, because we couldn't see when it collapsed. Our ground speed against the strong ebb tide reduced dramatically. It also proved useful to push out past Hearst Castle against the last of the flood tide and make pretend we were part of the race. Later, it was useful to run east down the Solent. The short buff meant that it was easy to pole out, just as if it were a symmetric spinnaker. However, when I adapted the mast to take a masthead halyard, I decided to order a bigger, full luff running asymmetric. I headed out towards Walton on the Nays to test the new sail in about 10 knots of wind. At 110 degrees true, it gave about 0.7 knots more boat speed than Jip had been doing at 90 degrees true. I pushed it up to 100 degrees true, and as the wind increased by about a knot, boat speed picked up to 6.5 knots. That was pretty much identical to the performance of the Code Zero under the same conditions, and 10 degrees closer than I could get with the old blue sail, which just dragged you sideways at 100 degrees. 
then tried running up the Stour, but the wind was very confused near the shipping jetties, and we were going slower than we had been doing under the jib. Eventually the wind settled at about 8 to 9 knots at 130 degrees true, which gave 5 to 5.5 knots of boat speed. That was one knot faster than the jib had been giving, and about half a knot faster than the Co Zero. The sail was very stable running between 130 and 150 degrees true, but any attempt to sail below that and it just collapsed. The only way to get it to fill again was to head up. By the time I dropped the chute and went back to the jib, the wind had gone up by a knot but we were still getting about a knot less than we had been doing with the chute. I hadn't planned on getting caught up in a barge race the next time I tried to get some readings. That made keeping a steady course tricky, and the amount of craft about caused a lot of wash. As soon as I got the chute up, the wind dropped, so there's no comparison to be made between the sails. The only way to get any stability in the whole thing was to harden up. The only problem with that was that we were then going so much faster than anyone else around that boats to windward started to get in the way. Having got a good set of readings above 150 degrees, I again tried sailing lower. Once more the sail collapsed, 
After a while it did try to come round to windward, nearly knocking me over in the process. However, it was far from being stable, and because there was no consistent pull, the boat speed never built up. Trying to get a stable sail when sailing deep downwind, single-handed and in seaway, is always difficult. I was sailing alongside my friend under white sails and he never really got away. This day proved too windy to get any cruising shoot readings out at sea, but to put the clip in as a reminder to me that the maximum displacement speed for me is about 8.2 knots. That's only true when the boat is more or less upright and the flat after sections are providing some lift. With the boat heeled I have never seen more than 7.8 knots. Putting more sail up to try and exceed these speeds would be pointless, unless there were big enough waves around to enable surfing. Back in the Stour, there was a lot less wind than there had been at sea. And as usual, as soon as I got the shoot up, the wind dropped even further. With a bit more wind than before, I did manage to get the sail to come round to windward at 160 degrees, but it was still hardly what you would call stable. I have set up my spinnaker pole so that the heel, the uphaul and the downhaul are all permanently attached at sea. To use it all I have to do is go forward and raise the heel of the pole up the mast, free the uphaul from its clip at the base of the mast and place the guy into the jaws. Back in the cockpit I can then raise the pole and square it up in very short order. This is what I did with the cruising chute and the transformation in stability was dramatic. We were travelling half a knot faster than when the chute had managed to come round to windward, and a lot faster than when it was collapsed. Ideally I would have squared the pole a bit more, but I'd left the snuffer downhaul a bit too tight. From much past experience, sailing like this is much faster than jibing the chute repeatedly from 150 degrees on one jibe to 150 on the other. If you don't want to pull out your chute, you're better off sailing goose winged with a jib. However, to do that well, you really need to pull out the jib. And if you're going to do that, you might as well pull out the chute. In pretty much the same wind, 
holdout jib was only about 0.8 of a knot slower than the pulled out chute. However, when you get up to 20 knots or more, the pulled out jib is just as fast as a chute and a lot more stable. This was yet another attempt to test the chute in 15 knots. I did occasionally manage that, but never on film. Mostly there was 12 knots of wind at 120 to 130 degrees true. On first hoisting the sail, the speed went up from 5.8 to 7 knots. However, I did think of another way of testing the speed enhancement over the jib. A week earlier, I'd passed this Bavaria 38 when I was also under white sails, in about the same wind and at the same angle. On that occasion, According to her AIS readout and my GPS, I overhauled her steadily at between 0.3 and half a knot. So I was interested to see what the difference was today. It was clearly more than half a knot, and when I went below to check her AIS readout, it was 2.2 knots less than my GPS. However, there had been a 15 knot gust which had temporarily put our speed up to 7.5 knots. The speed difference seemed to stabilise at 2 knots, of which somewhere between 1.5 and 1.7 knots must have been due to the cruising chute. I should have taken the sail down in the lee of the container ships. At first it was fine, but then we nearly broached onto the right hand bank, then a header forced me to drop the sail while heading for the shallows on the left hand bank. I've broken my own unwritten rule of not carrying the cruising chute in confined waters and it seemed to me this oyster skipper was doing the same thing. Carrying a parasail, which is really just a specialised cruising chute, this far up the oar well at low water looked very risky. The channel here goes from 5 metres to less than 2 in hardly any distance at all. Fortunately had enough crew to cope when the inevitable happened. To summarise the performance of the cruising chute, it was viable between 100 and 180 degrees true in 12 knots of wind. Between 100 and 110 there were a crossover with a code 0 where performance was the same and both gave a knot more speed than the jib. The further off the wind went, the more the advantage the chute had. After 120 degrees true it gave a knot and a half more speed than the jib and between a knot and half a knot more speed than the code zero, depending on the wind speed and angle. Personally, I don't hoist it in more than 15 knots, and only then when the wind is after 120 degrees. But if you have experienced crew, you can hoist it safely in up to about 20 knots. There isn't any point pushing it further than that. Gaining an extra knot of speed isn't always the most important thing. With a pulled out jib, we were making five knots or so 
with a knot of tide underneath us. We were heading up the west coast of Scotland to Kinloch Burvey. It had taken a long time to get here. Why rush? We just sat back and watched the scenery slide by. However, if you must press on and don't want to pull out a chute, there are a couple of other options. You can hoist the chute without a main, but that can cause a problem when you come to drop it if the wind is gusting. It also restricts your manoeuvrability if you come across shipping. A potential solution is to put one or two reefs in the main which leaves clear air at the top of the chute whilst retaining some manoeuvrability. I think the Code Zero and the running cruising chute complement each other nicely. But a lot of people ask, if you only carried one, which would it be? I think the answer depends on what sort of sailing you do. The cruising chute is undoubtedly the better sail downwind. And if you're often making long passages, this can be the sail that saves you from motoring. On the other hand, the Code Zero is more versatile and if you mostly day sail from a home port, on night wind days, it still makes sailing enjoyable, and otherwise you might well give up and motor home.